About the marketing thing, about me not being a great marketer, I don't like to go try to sell my gym and convince people to join the gym. The gym is what it is. If you see the gym and you think, this looks like where I wanna come train, or this looks like potentially something I'd be interested in, then that's awesome. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to people about the gym if they ask questions. Or if there's some hesitation, I'll be sure to like soften, let them know like it's not as intimidating as you think, or come try a class for free. So I do that in a sense. But when I'm around friends and family, uh, like at a, some function, and people are like, oh, you, you, you own a gym? Uh, how much is membership? And I'll tell them it's 80 bucks a month. And I'll tell you it's 80 bucks a month. It's a 24 hour access gym. 24 seven, 365 gym never closes. Um, it's got everything you would ever need for powerlifting, everything you would ever need for strongman, everything you would ever need for just strength training in general. I got a whole bunch of machines. It's a, a fairly big space for a privately owned or a, a, a small business gym, uh, I guess. There's strongman classes that I do that you can join for free. Um, it's a good atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. If I tell you that it's $80 a month and you think, oh, I'm not paying that, then that's fine. I'm not gonna try to convince you that it's worth your $80 per month. For people that can appreciate it, they know, yes, I'll pay $80 a month to go there. Um, so I don't try to sell it in that sense. Um, if people have a misconception about it and they're like, well, I'm not a power lifter, I'm not a strong man, or I'm not big and strong, then yeah, I'll tell them like, I'll bring them back down to reality and be like, that's not how it works. You know, like you're more than welcome to come in and train. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by I'm not great at marketing the gym. I try to kind of just let it sell itself. Um, and I think that comes down to when I first started the gym and people would ask me, like when I was in the Marine Corps, people would always drill me with questions, you know, like, oh, what, how are you gonna do this? When are you gonna do this? And like, you know, they would say it with a, an attitude to try to stump me. And I would always just think in my head, man, I don't, I don't really know yet, I'll figure it out. Um, I would rather just show you than tell you exactly how I'm gonna do it. So it's kind of how I view marketing. Like, I, I just rather show you what I got. And if you like it, cool, if not, no big deal. So, how does a staffless gym work 24 seven? How do you operate uh, 24 seven gym? How do you not have problems? How do you cope with the emotional attachment of your, to your gym going from private to public? Um, we operate a club currently, but are steps away from becoming public. It feels like turning my home into an Airbnb thinking about it. Yeah, like I said, when I first started the gym, I did not it was not open gym. You couldn't just come use the gym whenever you want. I kind of wanted to be in control and kind of form this atmosphere, set the standard for this is what we do here. Not that I was like a drill instructor about it, but I was just, uh, hey, we're gonna do strong, uh, strongman classes, barbell classes, et cetera. Um, and the reason it went to 24 was I had members who were signed up, they were coming to classes. And then one member I'm thinking of in particular, uh, he'd been coming for a while. He was a great member. I liked having him around and his schedule changed. And uh, he was like, hey, I can't come. I have to go to the gym like at 11 p.m. now. Uh, so I got to cancel. And I'm like, no, I can't have you cancel. I said, uh, dude, I'll give you a key. So like a physical actual key. I'll just give you a key, dude. Just come in whenever you want. Uh, and I was comfortable with him doing that. So he did. Uh, and then that expanded to another member and another member. Nobody taking advantage of it, but just uh, me like telling people, hey, I'll give you a membership. I'll give you, or I'll give you a key, come in, use the gym. And it just got to be a little more and a little more. And then I tried offering a VIP membership. So it was, you got your standard membership and then a VIP membership where I'm giving out keys. Um, and eventually I was just, uh, once I moved in 2000, I moved to, to the current location in 2016. And so that was three years after I opened. I said, I'm going full 24 hour access. And I was okay with that and I was comfortable with it because I had a good group of members. I didn't have a ton of members, but I had a good group of members, core group of members. And I had people coming in all throughout the day. So there was a morning, kind of a morning crew, an evening crew, afternoon crew, and everything in between. So I knew, okay, if I can't be here at night, uh, at least I know these guys will be here and they'll kind of police the gym a little bit. Um, and so that, that put my mind at ease. Um, uh, and to be honest, it wasn't like I said, Oh man, when I go 24 hour access, you know, there's gonna be a line of people out the door wanting to, wanting to sign up. That would be a good problem to have. Membership didn't really change. It was like, it didn't help a ton, but it was just something I offered. I said, no more basic membership and VIP membership. It's just a, a 24 hour membership for everyone. Um, and so I was okay with it. Also, I should say, I didn't have a family. I wasn't married. And so I could be at the gym 
all day, every day, and I was. So I wasn't really worried about that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I went from the jump of going from a private gym to a public 24-hour access gym. Didn't really have any issues with doing that. Uh, a couple rapid fire questions. Biz biggest expense is rent uh, per month. No, I do not own my own building. I would like to. Uh, I actually tried to this year. I had to re-up my lease um, and I thought I'd like to buy a place. Um, but there's just not the, the specifics that I need, the size of building that I need, um, the common areas and uh, parking lot and all that, my requests, there's nothing around. And mainly because um, landlords are not looking or, or landowners are not looking to sell. They would like to lease because they can make a lot more money in the long run leasing a building than selling it. The only situation I could think of would be someone who like needs money quick. Like I'm, I'm out of this, I'm heading on, over to another country. I need money now, I'm selling my building. Or if they were way in over their head, like bankrupt and they needed this money. But uh, there's really not a whole lot of incentive from my understanding for a, a landlord to sell. So I really didn't, couldn't find anything. So I do have to lease. Uh, lease, monthly lease is my biz biggest expense. Uh, about employees, I have two employees. I used to have six, but that was kind of for untamed strength plus other stuff, but uh, only two employees currently. And speaking of employees, what about running a gym? Do you most want to outsource or employ someone else to take care of? So I have those two employees, they help with, uh, their main job is cleaning the gym every day, just general cleanup of the gym, cleaning the bathrooms, and um, they are there to staff the gym because I can't always be now that I have a family, I'm away from the gym often. And so having them there during just normal day hours, they, uh, they can greet people when they come in. If they have questions, they can answer those questions. If someone signs up and needs to come get their 24 hour access key fob, they're there to greet them and set their key fob up and all that. Um, so that would be something that I outsource to them. Not because I dread cleaning, uh, I just don't have the time to. When I used to spend 12, 14, 16 hours a day at the gym, then yeah, I just used to do, I used to do that myself. But, so I have them do it. Another thing would be bookkeeping. I have an accountant who does the bookkeeping and the taxes. Um, taxes for many years was such a headache. There were years where I was trying to be as honest as possible, but I didn't calculate it correct. And sure enough, um, I get some bill that's ridiculously high, like a couple years in a row. Yo, no, you actually owe us this. I'm like, oh no, I don't have that money. Um, and then there were years where, you know, as a business owner, you have to pay estimated taxes. You kind of have to guess like, okay, I think this is how much I should be paying. And I was at the point where I'm like, why am I paying like 40% of my income uh, in taxes? I was just, I was uh, lost, I needed help. So those are the two things. Uh, cleaning, just attendance at the gym, having their presence at the gym, someone to greet, be, uh, greet people at the door, and uh, bookkeeping. Toilet paper expense. So this morning I went and looked, I saw that question, I looked at um, how many invoices I've had in the past year, and it's been four invoices. Typically I spend about 1500 bucks on those invoices. That's for toilet paper. Sometimes I do throw some soap in there, hand soap, but that lasts a lot longer. The liquid hand soap lasts a lot longer than um, toilet paper. So let's do some math. If that was 1500 bucks four times a year, that would be 3000 times to 6000. So six, let's say $6,000 a year on toilet paper divided by 12 would be 500 bucks a month on toilet paper. There you go. Did local ads on Instagram and Facebook work? Are they worth the investment? No, they're not. Um, I've paid for ads like 2013, 14, 15. I paid for ads, not for the gym, but for my competitions. And I think that I got a couple signups. I actually had one uh, year where I asked how you heard about the competition. There were a couple people who said a Facebook ad. I don't think Facebook is nearly what it was 10 years ago. Um, and nowadays your phone, not even Instagram and Facebook, but our phones are so inundated with advertisements and sponsored ads that it's, uh, it's just, uh, I feel like it's so easy to overlook, you know, a quick ad. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's worth it. I think what you should do is create a social media account, Facebook, not Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever that's free to do. And then just create content or advertise there. Uh, and hope that that goes somewhere, but don't rely on Instagram to pump it out for you. Another thing that helps with um, member retention. So I like to host competitions at the gym. 
and I don't always host them. Sometimes it's members that host them, sometimes it's other gyms that host at my gym. Uh, tomorrow, there's a local powerlifting gym, Old School Iron, hosting a competition at my gym. Um, so uh, it doesn't cost me money, it just costs me my, my time and all that, but it is a, uh, a good way to get members excited about something. If you have a competition at your gym or some function at your gym, people really like that. Uh, and I think that it gives them something to train for, they can compete on their home field, so I think that that helps with member retention also. Um, one other thing that I do that maybe you should, shouldn't do, I don't know. I don't, I don't hire coaches. I've never hired a coach. Um, with that said, there are coaches at the gym and uh, they are members of the gym and they coach or program for other people. Now those other people have to be members they can't bring in a bunch of non-members and coach them there. Uh, if you want to bring in your flock of trainees or clients, cool, as long as they have a paying gym membership. Um, and so the reason I allow that is because one, I just think that if I put up a bunch of rules, like if you're going to do programming for someone, if you're going to do coaching for someone, uh, you need to give me a cut. It's going to lead to people being dishonest, trying to hide it from me, trying to pretend like they're not coaching them when they are. And I don't want to deal with that. Um, so my thinking is, if Bob is at the gym and he's programming for, and he works out there, and he does some powerlifting program for so-and-so and he charges them whatever price he wants, I don't really care. Because if Bob is taking care of them and giving them a program to do, they're more likely to continue using their membership. Um, so that, I think that helps with member retention, honestly, is not being so stern with these rules of, if you're going to train someone, it's got to go through me, you got to get approved by me, you got to pay me this, pay me that. Because then at that point, people are like, oh, I'll just go train somewhere else. Um, so, uh, yeah. Let's do uh, another question before I do another set here. Hardest part about opening, uh, challenges you faced when you first opened. I think the one thing that pops into my mind is asking people for money was really challenging. Still don't like doing it, but asking people for money was hard for me. Um, when I first opened the gym, I said first month was free because I just I didn't want I wanted people to get in there. I also was like it was my way of like procrastinating. Like I don't like charging people. Like just get in the gym, train, and then we'll talk about money later. Um, so I didn't like I felt uncomfortable asking people for money, asking people to sign up. And so um, my experience was after a month, I had told people, hey, uh, free months over. Uh, you sign up, the website's set up, go ahead and sign up, uh, you know, within the next couple days and so-and-so. Uh, and then people would still come, but there was no sign-ups. And I'm like, uh, hey guys, yeah, um, I know you like coming here. Uh, you got to start paying. I got to start charging so I can keep this place open. Uh, still didn't really get people to sign up, maybe here or there. But people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, bro, for sure. I'll get, I'll get it later. Um, I'll get to it. I get paid this day. I'll do it, this and that. Uh, and I'm like, hey, sounds good. It sounds good. You know, I didn't want to, like, uh, be too blunt or upfront. And uh, it, just was, it just was such a hard thing to do. Um, even when I tell people about the gym first, and they'd be like, how much is it? And I'm like, $70 a month. And they're like, oh, pff, I go to Planet Fitness for $9.99 a month. The Fitness 19 down the street is $20 a month. Oh, you know why? And I'm like, uh, I just didn't like uh, asking people for money. And uh, that was probably the most challenging part. I think that um, this can kind of transition into another question about what are some good um, traits or characteristics of a gym owner. If you are working with people at the start, I think that it's really, uh, it helps to be able to talk to people, to be a people person. And it helps to be comfortable in giving people direction or telling people what to do. And I think the military helped me with that. Um, when you have a group of people in front of you and you have to tell them what to do, clear, concise instructions, it's uh, kind of nerve wracking. Um, you know, you're thinking, like, what if they ask this question and I don't know? What if I'm not clear? What if I'm stumbling over my words? It's just hard to tell someone what to do. It's not like just having a casual conversation. Uh, and so I think that, that you should work on that and that'll really help with training people, training individuals, um, and training groups of people. You used to say that X is not a good reason to open a gym, but you never said what is a good reason. That's a good observation. I never said what is a good reason to start the gym because I don't feel like that's 
someone who wants to open a gym doesn't need convincing that they should open a gym. I don't think that I'm gonna make a YouTube video and say, you know, here's three reasons why you should open a gym. And then someone re watches it and says, I think I just might open a gym. That's uh, not the right mindset to go on. And that was never my way of thinking either. I never thought like, hey, what are some good reasons to open a gym? I was just dead set on I am opening a gym. I don't care what it takes. And I just had a lot of people say like, you know, often like, oh, opening a gym sounds cool because this, this, and this. And so that's why I would make videos like, hey, this is not a good reason to open a gym. Uh, think twice before saying, maybe I'm gonna open a gym. And so that was kind of the reason why I said, I never listed why, what a good reason was. But I'll play along. Uh, some good reasons to open a gym. This is, doesn't, isn't just a gym, but this is just a business. Owning your own business, you are in charge. I like being in charge. I like being responsible for myself. I don't have to report to a boss. I don't have to work with coworkers. I don't have to work with business partners or, or, or anything like that. I don't have to run things by someone. I don't have to ask for permission. I don't have to, I get to make all decisions on my own. Um, so that's just business ownership. But as far as a gym goes, if you're passionate about something, if you love fitness, if you love lifting weights, if you love gym equipment, then having a big space as a blank canvas, you get to create whatever you want. For the most part, like money's a limiting factor. It'd be nice if I was a millionaire and I could just buy whatever I wanted. But uh, you know, for the most part, I can decide like, this is how I want the gym to look. I want more of this equipment. I want less of that equipment. I, uh, I, you know, I, do, I want this, I don't want that. I'm in total control. And so to be able to build your own gym is really, really cool. No different than someone who's uh, passionate about baking. Like I'm gonna open a bakery and I'm gonna sell this stuff. I'm gonna write this menu. Uh, I'm gonna make it a, make what I love doing a living from it. Hey Alan, what does the future of gym ownership and culture look like to you? Another question asked, what is the future of Untamed like? Do you want to expand? Do you want to, are you gonna go multiple locations? Are you gonna open one in another state? So here's the thing about growth. More is not always better. And I've spent many years trying to earn more money, earn more money, get more members, bigger, 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 bigger. And I'm not saying that I'm done with that or that I don't want more members or that I don't want more money. But there is a point, and I found this out for myself, there is a point at which more is not always better. You don't actually want a bigger or big, busier location or business as a business owner. So let me kind of paint this picture of like a mom and pop shop. Let's say you go into a mom and pop restaurant as a customer and you're like, man, this place is great. You know, uh, it's never busy. I always come in here. Um, mom and pop are the sweetest people. Mom comes out and pours my coffee. Uh, we talk, we chat. Dad's back there, you know, making a great breakfast for me. This is just great. What a great establishment. I don't understand why people wait for an hour at IHOP down the street. This is the place to be. And then one day you come in there and they're like, hey, you got reservations? Reservations? I've never been to reservations here. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's gonna be an hour wait if you don't have reservations. And you go sit down and mom's not the one to pour your coffee. It's a new employee. She's not very personal, she just kind of pours your coffee and takes off and dad's not back there. Uh, someone else is making breakfast, it's not as good. It's just crazy busy and crowded. And part of you feels good, uh, happy for mom and pop because they're doing really well. But then part of you is like, well, now my favorite place is gone. This place is not what it used to be. It's not as good as what it used to be, you know, as good as I remember it. And you can sort of have that in a gym. So if I continue just getting more space, more space, more members, and I just have this place overflowing with people, all types of people, and I get more and more equipment. And let's say I want, I'm gonna get an octagon for people who like MMA and punching bags and speed bags, and I'm gonna get a sauna, and I'm gonna get all these amenities, and I just want more people in this place. It starts to water down the facility. There's a point in which I want to provide as much as I can to the members. 
uh, but I really want to focus on the core group of members and figure out why people come to my gym. I don't want to just mimic a 24 hour fitness. Um, and so I, I consider that. Uh, the more members I get, uh, the more it can somewhat water down the facility or the experience. Now with that said, I do need more members in order to pay for more squat racks, more monoliths to replace bars. So it's a, it's a balance and you kind of have to find that balance. Uh, also, I have, I talk way too much. I'm gonna do a set here. I'm just gonna leave this rolling. I have, I am not making the most amount of money I've ever made right now. I have made yearly and monthly a lot more money, like a good, good chunk more money. And at that time I had six employees and it was a freaking headache. I didn't like it and I was making quite a bit more money. Uh, I am way more happy now, even though I'm making less money monthly, quite a bit more. Um, I'm just so much happier because it was so stressful dealing with having more employees and uh, to where I was like sitting there laying in bed at night like thinking about all this stuff. I've never had that. I usually hit my head hits the pillow, boom, I'm asleep, boom, I wake up. I'm happy, ready to go. I was like thinking about it at night. I'd wake up, still be thinking about this and it was really weighing heavily on me and I would have to deal with like putting out these fires and it was not worth the extra money. Um, and so I'm happier now, even though I'm earning a little bit less money. And uh, so that's just, I guess, something to consider. More money, more problems. More money is not always a good thing. Um, I have to remember when I first started out, my dream was to just make enough money to survive, just to get by and to, to do what I love every day. I don't need to be a millionaire. I don't need to take vacations to Bora Bora every you know, six months. Uh, I would just like to, hey, every once in a while I'll go camping with my family. So I don't even remember where I'm, what I'm talking about or what question I'm answering here. Um, yeah, my, my overarching theme here is more money, more problems sometimes. How much research did you put in determining the location of your gym? Were you sure the area you were based at could meet your revenue needs? All of these questions about uh, revenue and where to start and all this kind of stuff, I wanted to start dirt cheap. I wanted to start with something really small. A small space, a little bit of equipment. I knew I had nothing but time to work with people. And so um, a big selling point was working with me, was going to my uh, small group classes, was doing personal training with me and my facility. Um, another uh, story I, I'd like to share, um, and you know, I was really embarrassed at the time, but um, I was, uh, I advertised the gym as a, a powerlifting gym when I first started, and it was not. I didn't have good bars, I didn't have good racks. I didn't have bands, chains, I didn't have monolift, I didn't have combo racks, I didn't have comp plates. Nothing that would make it a powerlifting gym other than I guess I had uh, some squat racks and some really crappy benches. And uh, I was training one evening, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, and two of her friends. And we were doing like some dumbbell stuff, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was an evening and I was just training those three. And I let them listen to whatever they wanted to on the, mute, on the stereo. And they were listening to like Katy Perry or something like that. And uh, in walks this big, huge dude. It's like six and a half feet tall. Kind of walks in like ducks under the door. Uh, huge dude. And uh, I had at this time never really seen like power lifters, you know? And this dude was a big power to hit a ST shirt on, super training shirt. And uh, it turns out he was from super training. So if you think about 2014 super training, when they were at the first location, you got Mark Bell, like probably Scott Cartwright, these big, huge power lifters, uh, like the peak of super training. Um, he came from their gym and he was looking for a new power lifting gym. And uh, he was very polite, very respectful. He didn't like, you know, trash my gym or talk bad about it. But he just said, yeah, you know, I heard, uh, heard about this was a power lifting gym. And he was kind of wondering like, am I on the right spot? Katy Perry playing and these girls like doing, you know, like dumbbell rows or something. And uh, 
I was just so embarrassed, man. I was like crushed. I was like, oh, this guy is who I want. And he's, this is what he sees, his first impression. I told him, yeah, we're doing like some, uh, just a little class right now. But yeah, the gym is powerlifting. You can, yeah, you come in. And he was like, oh, this is cool, man. He's like, yeah, you know, just kind of talking me out, being polite. And he's like, uh, you got a good thing going here, man. Uh, good luck to you. And he had left. And the whole night I'm like sitting there, like sleeping wide awake, like, oh no, that was, I ruined it. Uh, but uh, he actually came to the gym to Untamed Strength years later, and uh, he signed up for a little bit, but something uh, he had to move and he left. So he got to see kind of the growth after a few years, which was cool. I felt good. Like I saw him, my eyes lit up. I said, you came to Untamed Strength years ago. He's like, yeah, man, this place looks a lot different now. So that was, that was cool. But um, uh, so about uh, how much research did you go into determining the location of your gym um, and revenue needs? So at one thing with my gym and my YouTube channel and the success of those two things was definitely timing. If I tried to open Untamed Strength now, I don't know that I would have as good of a response. If I tried to start a YouTube channel right now, I don't know if it would have a good enough response. If I made a how to squat video, how many people are searching for that still? Or how many people would watch that? It's just saturated with that kind of uh, information. So I think that timing helped a lot and there was not anything there were some CrossFit gyms, but there weren't like privately owned gyms. Uh, so it wasn't really a thing. So I think that that helped me a lot. There were certainly not strongman gyms. Uh, and I still stand above all other gyms in the area as far as strongman equipment. So the timing really, really helped me. I didn't do a lot of research. I didn't do a lot of preparing. If you can get that theme out of all these Q&A videos. I didn't have a great plan. I didn't prep much. I just had a very small idea and passion and I wanted to grow from there. I just wanted to plant this seed and grow from there. I was in the Marine Corps before I opened the gym and I spent a few years just racking my brain, a couple years, racking my brain with questions. What, what is this and what do I do for this and how do I do this and what do I do that? And I you know, would look a little bit online and um, I even did a Elliot Hulse, uh, bought an Elliot Hulse uh, ebook about starting your own gym and I'm like, I was reading it, but I couldn't really relate to any of it. I didn't really know what it meant uh, as far as like marketing. And, you know, he was talking about like how to earn $10,000 a month. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, if I could get a thousand bucks a month, that'd be awesome. So I just couldn't relate to much of it. But I was so sick of asking questions and wondering that I was like, I just want to start this small and grow from there. Um, I got nothing but time, nothing but energy, um, no responsibilities other than this gym. So let's do it. And, uh, you know, uh, one, one of my uh, friends, uh, my brother's friend had said to me when I got out, he's like, dude, what are you doing with this thing? And he's like, why would you not go to school right now and get the GI bill and collect some revenue from that? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And I was like, I don't wanna spend time doing anything but this. Uh, I don't wanna go here to school if it means I get money so I can supplement this. I just want 24 seven, 365 all in with this and I'll, I'll go from there. So uh, I didn't do a lot of um, research into determining location of your gym. I also opened a gym close to where I am from, uh, close to my hometown and where I was living. So I knew I didn't really, I was familiar with the area, didn't really go outside of that. Um, so I didn't say, all right, I'm out of the Marine Corps, which state should I go to, what city should I go to, where's the market best? Um, I couldn't predict any of that. So I didn't put much research into the location of my gym. It was just, is this like in somewhat proximity that I can like get here frequently? Um, and where is rent ex uh, affordable pretty much? Uh, and then uh, the question about uh, how close were you, have you been to closing the gym? These questions have like consumed me over the past few days because like once I read them, I just opened up a huge can of worm and I'm thinking about answers to all this. I'm like reliving a bunch of this stuff and just thinking a lot about it. And I'm obviously not doing a whole lot of training because I'm talking so much. So I'm uh, happy to get this stuff off my chest. But about closing the gym, I realized that when I answered that, I think I took more of a, how long, uh, how close were you to closing the gym in your brain, in your mind? And I never had the mindset of like, oh, I might close, ever. Um, but as far as like financially, how close have I been to closing the gym? There's been two months in the beginning when I r was out of money and I couldn't pay rent. Um, one month, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, how sweet, uh, she gave me, she knew I was hurting and I was like kind of, I don't know where I'm gonna get this money. Um, she gave me 500 bucks and that helped me pay rent for that month. 
And then the next month, uh, my mom had come in, had uh, uh, sold her house, and so she got some upfront money. Um, and she knew I was kind of hurting. I didn't ask for it, I didn't tell her I was hurting, but she just kind of out of the blue, the universe was helping me. She just wrote me a $750 check and that helped me pay rent the next month. Um, and then I don't know what I did after that, uh, I, but I managed to pay rent and get by from then on. So I guess those two months, there were two months when I couldn't pay rent and I was like, uh, I don't know where I'm gonna get this money. Um, and so uh, there was actually more than two months because I, I uh, at one point I sold a lot of my Marine Corps stuff, which is unfortunate. Still have a pair of my camis and stuff like that. Um, but I had a lot of military equipment. When I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, all of my issued stuff was, they like lost the paperwork for when they issued it to me. So when I went to check out, they were like, mm, you have nothing on file. And I said, mm, that's right, that sounds right. So I got to keep a lot of it, but I sold it. Uh, Cause I realized on Craigslist, damn, people are like really collecting this stuff hard. And uh, so I sold a lot of it for a good amount of money. Like I'm talking like flat ja flak jacket and like uh, field gear. Um, and so I was able to sell a lot of that st stuff uh, and that helped me pay rent. Um, I've talked before, I was, uh, I've started flipping tires, uh, not in a strongman sense, but I started getting free tires and then selling them on Craigslist for like 40, 50, 60 bucks, 80 bucks. And then I would do delivery also. And that helped me pay rent uh, a couple times when I was short a few hundred bucks. Unfortunately, I sold that leg press that I bought, which is an awesome leg press. Um, I bought the leg press, a, a squat rack, and a bunch of hex dumbbells for $500, and I was able to sell the leg press only for $500. Bucks. Um, so I was selling equipment, which was uh, just a bad, a bad thing to have to do to like sell your gym in order to keep it afloat. Um, so those would be like the few months that I could not afford rent and I had to figure out a way to make some money. But uh, that, yeah, that would be my answer. Financially, how close have I been to like not paying rent those, those handful of months? <sighs> Where do you get your equipment? Currently searching for dumbbell sets for a home gym. In your case, I would suggest uh, definitely suggest Facebook Marketplace. Try to see, there's always stuff like that, simple stuff like dumbbells that are for sale. If you have a used sporting goods store in your area, I have two, no, three. Uh, that really, that's really, really helpful. Um, as far as me deciding on what equipment to use, I'm gonna pick something that's reliable. A, a lot of powerlifting stuff is name brand. Um, if I were to buy some some like off name, uh, you know, deadlift bar. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna use it, but the name brand stuff people really like. Oh, you have a Texas deadlift bar? You have a Rogue deadlift bar? You have a Kabuki deadlift bar? Like people who know these things or hear these things are really attracted to it. Um, some people not necessarily, they just pick whatever is, uh, whatever's not being used. But a lot of that name brand stuff for powerlifting uh, is really helpful. Um, and again, pick something reliable. So I used to go really cheap with sandbags for strongman. I went to a military store and I used my own uh, green sea bags. Those things popped, I don't even, like in no time, sand everywhere. So, okay, maybe I should buy an iron mine sandbag because um, that's what they use at World's Strongest Man. And so people just see those blue sandbags and think, oh sweet, I've seen those in World's Strongest Man. Stuff like that. Uh, with machines, I, will, I almost always buy the same type of machines just based on the name because the name sells itself and it's uh, reliable. Like Hammer Strength, uh, for example, Precore or Icarian, that stuff is uh, built to last. And I know that the cable and the belt's not gonna break on me. Uh, it's just, again, it just has a long standing history. So I know that it's reliable. Uh, but if I'm buying, sometimes I do get stuff like more plates, um, or people sell, I've sold, they sold uh, some people during the pandemic when all the plates were gone, they bought competition plates even though they're not power lifters and they don't compete. But I've bought a lot of uh, aftermarket um, Facebook marketplace kilo plates because people sell those. Uh, so sometimes I do buy stuff on Facebook marketplace, but I'm not gonna get like, I wouldn't buy like a treadmill from some little home gym and expect that to last in a commercial gym where people are using it 
throughout the entire day. Um, <clears throat> so there's that kind of stuff. And I learned that the, not the hard way, but uh, thankfully someone kind of educated me on that. I was gonna buy a treadmill and the guy was like, what are you using this for? And he was like, man, this is good for like, if you wanna walk on it, uh, like a couple times a week, but uh, I would not put a 300 pound dude like shuffling on this. This is not commercial grade, this is home gym grade. Uh, and so I was like, oh wow, thanks for the heads up. So stuff like that um, kind of makes me, uh, I take into consideration when purchasing gym equipment. All right, camera was acting funny, I had to take care of some stuff here. So uh, in today's market, how much does it cost per month to run your size of gym? Obviously every location and size is different, but just curious what a rough average monthly operation costs for something like that. So what I would say is, <clears throat> rent lease for a commercial building. I mean, it depends on what state you're in, what county you're in, what city you're in, location, you know, if you're midtown, if you're on the, wherever. Um, but it's gonna be probably, if I would have to guess, one to three dollars per square foot. So let's, uh, let's just play some numbers. Let's paint a picture here, have some fun with this. I used to do this before I opened Untamed. <clears throat> so let's say you have a uh, 2,000 square feet of warehouse. You just have to figure out how much space do I need? How much space can I work with? What's available? 2,000 square feet, that would be uh, 50 feet wide by 40 feet long. 50 by 40 would be 2,000, my math is correct. Um, and let's say you have 2,000 square feet and you pay, uh, we'll cut that in half, one to three dollars. Two dollars per square foot. So that's $4,000 per month you have to pay on just rent, okay? Let's say uh, you can't be there all the time and so you want an employee to work 40 hours a week. Uh, let's say you pay that employee $15 an hour. Again, it depends on where you live for minimum wage, et cetera. Let's say 15, cost of living, let's say $15 an hour, 40 hours a week. 15 times 40 is, uh, 15 times four is 60, so $600 a week on payroll and that's times four weeks in a month. So $2,400 a month on payroll. So I've got $4,000 for rent and then 2,400 for uh, payroll. That's $6,400 a month on just rent and payroll. And then uh, let's just kind of round up to 7,000 for miscellaneous bills, uh, electric. Maybe you've got stuff on top of that like you're paying off um, loan interest or you have credit card bills, uh, etc. Let's just go stop there, okay? $7,000 a month for this building, this gym that you're operating. Uh, you're gonna have to crunch some numbers then. So, okay, I got $7,000 a month I have to figure out how to make. So let's say that's 100 members at $70 each. Uh, there's no way I can accommodate 100 members in this gym or that would take way too long to get 100 members. I only have zero right now. Um, so uh, maybe I could do 50 members at $140 a month. Well, I can't charge $140 a month on this gym. So you've just got to figure that out. Uh, maybe you'll have to find a place that's only 1,000 square feet or you'll have to find a 2,000 square foot warehouse with far less rent. Or you're gonna say, I'm not, I can't afford to have an employee. I'm gonna be the employee, I'm gonna staff the gym. So that's just roughly how you kind of crunch those numbers.